So I've created an image on one computer and finished doing everything on it, putting all the software that needs to be on there, taking everything off that needs to come off. I joined it to the domain, tested all the group policies and what is important to do before you create a system image is remove it from the domain so that then when you image the new computers and change their name it can cause havoc in Active Directory because you essentially have two computers joined to the domain, two separate computers with the same name and then you rename one of them and that doesn't always create a good relationship between the computer and Active Directory so if you're not using Windows Deployment Service it's better to undomain the computer, I add it to a work group create the image and then clone it across so I've done that and for anyone that doesn't know if you go to backup and restore it's just create a system image here um, it's a one-time thing I did it to a network location did it onto a shared drive on the server and then after you've done that it will ask you to create a system repair disk you can do that here and then what you do is you boot the computer from that disk point it towards the image that's been made from creating it here um, so if it's on a network location you obviously have to have authentication to access that share or it's more simple to just put it on a hard drive plug it into the computer boot from the system repair disk and then it will image now things to note the computer will have the name of the computer that you originally made the image on so this computer now is actually the third workstation but has the name of the first workstation and any license keys if they're not a multiple activation key in a domain environment a large domain environment say an enterprise um, or a large business some medium-sized businesses use them um, you'll find multiple activation keys where you can put it in the image put it onto WDS and then any computer because it's a multi activation key you won't need to reactivate Windows and the same goes with Office but in my case I'm using the um, it's the serial key that's on the COA attached to the case and that's an OEM key so uh, each of those is unique and needs to be see if I try and activate this now it will activate I will have to type in a different product key so I'll type in the one that's on the case uh, but first of all we can rename this to 03 that will need a restart and then after that we'll join it to the domain but I'm going to restart before I join it to the domain because that name won't quite have taken effect until the computer's actually restarted okay so now that we're coming back on I'm just waiting for the network connection to be picked up here um, one thing to know I'm using Office 365 with um, it's the business edition so it does come with desktop version of Office now a handy thing about that is that does use a multiple activation key the download that you do from Office 365 comes with the key already programmed into the software and straight away it's already activated so we can not have to worry about that just a Windows key so when we open system properties up we can see now that the domain the domain hasn't been joined uh, we're just still part of that work group that I put the master image in <clears throat> but the computer name has changed so that's the main thing now I haven't set up DHCP yet for the server because I already have a server that is serving DHCP and DNS so at the moment the new server is just DNS when I move it to the client site I will set up DHCP so that's just a quick task to do on site I'm doing as much off site as I can but um, I, yeah I could set up a separate network use VLANs etc but to be honest it's much easier just to set it up as a DNS server um, I can use an IP address and a default gateway from um, my DHCP server which is my edge router and then I'm just going to use 1230 as a DNS which is that HP micro server so just to check that you still get internet once it's joined which should be fine 
because DNS is set up and working on that 1.230 server. So there we go, the internet's fine. And that's all good. So back to these settings, we should now be able to find the domain. And there we go. And there we go. So obviously now a restart is required again. So we'll just do that. And things to notice when we do restart is it will be a domain computer so we'll come back on with a username and a logon screen. Um, and then we'll be ready to use with the roaming profiles that I've set up as a domain workstation. Now I've logged in um, as myself uh, as an administrator account. The first few logons are always slow for these types of setups once something's joined to a domain. And the first few logons, um, the first few restarts and logons are, are both quite slow. It can take up to three restarts for some group policies to take effect fully. Now, I've never really had that, um, that experience. And if they aren't taking effect properly, you can do a command line uh, GP update slash force and then the dialog will ask you to log off so that's just in command line gp update slash force Ooh. that will update the group policies and force them to apply properly usually it will say some policies can't be applied without a restart or log off um, there we go, folder redirection. So, okay to log off, and I'll just hit yes. Now the policies were working, but uh, that's just to show anyone who's having difficulties with group policies not taking effect. Just something to note. That that's a useful tool. Now back to adding computers to a domain this is going to be um, very tedious for people that are quite commonly used to it. The DNS that you're using must be uh, within the Active Directory forest so you can't use your router's DHCP which will assign the router as DNS. Um, and then try and join a server, it will just not find it. Uh, so you have to have DNS running on the server or if it's multi-server environment you can just have a DNS server that's in the Active Directory forest which if you have virtualization or lots of servers usually you will have a dedicated DNS server. Um, I don't and in this scenario we have one server and it's having it's got all the FISMA roles on it, so it's going to do DNS, DHCP and Active Directory. And it doesn't need to do anything else. It serves as a backup um, and Windows Server Update services. But Windows Deployment is not required and Virtualization certainly isn't required. Because um, there's nothing really that needs to go on it. And for Virtualization, I'd have to use... Um, I'm more accustomed to Hyper-V, Microsoft Hyper-V because I've usually worked in Windows Server environments. I have used VMware, but um, I have a lot more experience in Hyper-V. So if I was going to virtualize, that's what I would use. And the licenses will be a lot more expensive. This was quite a cheap license for a server. It was about £150, if that. I think it was about 130 So for Microsoft Server, that's not too bad, really. Um, okay, so just show you in the documents section um, all the policies that have been applied now um, it's on the server user profiles dollar so it's a hidden share 
um, and that's where the documents will be stored, obviously synchronised if the computer's offline. Now, I've also hidden, there's the repair disk still in the DVD drive um, that I booted off to image this computer. But you can also see I've hidden the C drive and mapped a user directory. So all that is, is a link to where all of the redirected folders are. Obviously, they're still here in the quick, um, whatever this is called now, the quick access tab. Uh, it keeps changing each version of Windows. But um, just, I find it's, it's easier to have like a U drive. So you can say to someone, oh, it's in your U drive in their documents. And this folder here is exactly the same as clicking on here. It's exactly the same location. So... You can see that here, um, it's in the same location. So that's about it really. Um, I've applied a few group policies. Um, what else did I do? Obviously you saw from the login screen there's no control alt delete required and it doesn't remember the last user. Now that's perhaps my bad habit as that's how I've set up most large networks because you want to have this uniformed appearance to all the computers so not to have um, not to have the last username on there so that anyone could use the computers now in the case of the client that I'm working for now the users aren't really going to change so I'd probably be saving them some effort of typing in their username every time but um, I think it it provides a much more professional look for the computers with them turning on and going straight to this screen. So, um, yeah, that's about it for the client computers. This is just an overview of the software that I've installed on the machines. Um, basic stuff, Adobe Reader. Um, I've put iTunes on and all support software for iTunes. I've used Bitdefender. I have the full paid version and find it very good um, so I just put a free edition on for them obviously there's um, Windows Defender or whatever it was called in Windows 7 um, because this is Windows 7 Professional um, some more Apple support software, CCleaner, Chrome all the Intel stock software um, there's actual iTunes, Java Office 365 business, so that's the actual desktop Office 365 apps. Um, there's just some features um, that have been installed through Windows updates. Uh, I've put Firefox on. PDF Creator was some software that they've used before and wanted on the machines. Uh, there's just some driver software, VLC and WinRAR. So... Um, one last thing that's going to go on these machines will be Sage, but they currently have a Sage set up in place, so I'm going to have to do this on site. I'm going to have to take it off the old server, move it to the new server. Um, from what I've seen, the Sage software is installed on the client computers, and then it just needs a network location to store and access files. There's no software as such installed on the actual server. So the server's good to go, and the client machines just need some software installing on site. So these are computers themselves, the Dell Optiplex 755 series. Um, this is the small form factor, not the ultra small form factor tower. Um, as you can see on the front there, I have changed the floppy drives out for card readers. They were three pounds from PC World, so not really a great cost, and much more useful than a floppy disk drive. One of the computers has a DVD rewriter, this particular model, and the other two have just standard DVD read-only drives. Now the machine with the DVD rewrite drive, the first workstation, also has a dual port graphics card with uh, one of the connectors there that splits into two VGA monitor connections. You can just see there the cable that comes out the graphics card which is an X1300 card and goes into two VGA 
ports there. Now inside the machines, they all have a dual core processor, an Intel processor. Uh, I think they're Pentium based. You can probably see throughout the videos when I've been on System Properties page. Um, nothing special processor wise. 4GB of RAM and just a bog standard um, 250 gig hard drive. I think one of them has a 160 gig hard drive in. But uh, the hard drive space is not really relevant as nothing's really stored locally apart from program files. Um, I would recommend if someone was going to do this process um, to suggest an SSD. For the price uh, you could get a you could get a fairly good SSD for 30 to 40 pounds that would have enough capacity for all the program files you should need. Um, unfortunately, another company had sold my client these computers over a year ago now, and they charged them over 200 pounds for them. Which anyone in the UK, I don't know what that works out in dollars, but anyone in the UK will know that a refurbished 755 is probably 40 to 50 pounds for that sort of spec online so 200 pounds was a steep price uh, considering a client bought free so 600 pounds for free fairly uh, low spec computers um, but I've done my best with what uh, what I have to work with um, here is the slim laptop style DVD drive um, and underneath that is the card readers that I installed and then you can see the four sticks of RAM there so underneath there um, the processor is behind this black cover there there's a fan at the front here the heat sink is here and you can just see the back of the heat sink there. The hard drive is then here underneath there are all the um, all the motherboard. Uh, there's not many connections on the motherboard. Uh, I had to remove the hard drive to fit the card reader um, just down in the corner here. And underneath that in one of the workstations, as I've previously mentioned, there's a dual port graphics card. So that is sitting down underneath the hard drive at the bottom here. Uh, they all have gigabit LAN ports, which is a plus side considering the age of the computer. And they're all running Windows 7 Professional Edition, um, all with OEM serial keys attached to the case.